Welcome to Lesson 38 of Through the Bible in a Year. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for the opportunity to be in your word this week, and we ask your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and minds to understand it in a deeper way and to the power to live it out in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're jumping into um, two more of the books of Solomon and kind of leads into the first question here as we jump into Ecclesiastes. Who wrote Ecclesiastes and how does he start this book in chapter 1, verse 2? And it's Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes. But what we're going to see here, just to give you a heads up, is a completely different look at wisdom than we saw what he gave us in Proverbs. And in Proverbs, what we see is, is um, you know, wisdom is to be sought after. It's this, this precious gift from God. And it really kind of focuses more on godly wisdom. Um, he talks about wisdom here as well in Ecclesiastes, and but it kind of bounces back and forth between godly wisdom and in worldly wisdom and kind of a different outlook on life, a much more negative view of things because in Proverbs it was almost like a vending machine. You, you put in, you know, this, you get that out. You get more wisdom, you get more blessing back. Um, less wisdom, less blessing back. But, you know, Solomon gets into things like the fact that sometimes in life things don't make sense. That sometimes, you know, good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good and wise people. And so we see kind of a whole nother picture here in the, in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. And how does he start the book? Basically, you know, he states that pretty much everything in life to a great extent is, is vanity, like a chasing after the wind. And we see this theme over and over again. Question two, what does the author say about wisdom in 118? What application can we see in this? And again, you know, very different than what we saw in, in Proverbs. Um, what he's saying is that, you know, he's obviously got this gift of wisdom. You know, he prayed for, you know, or actually God gave him the choice of whatever he wanted in life. He chose wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. He also gave him great wealth. And what he's seeing in his wisdom is that people are messed up. The world's messed up. The world's sinful. The more wise he got, the more he saw how messed up things really were. He saw the, the bad side of life. There's a bad side of life, but also with wisdom you can view the right side of life. And Solomon seemed to be wrapped up in the negative side and not as much in the positive side. And you know, we have to realize that as gifted of a leader as he was, gifted as a king as he was, he struggled in his life because of his own doing. He took on you know, a thousand wives and concubines. He wasn't supposed to do that. He so often, even though he's wise, so often acted in, in ignorance, and he caused a lot of his own problems. And, and so in his, the wisdom he had, he so often could see the negativity and the problems in his own life in a deeper way. But he didn't seem to have the ability to get it all together. And even though he's a believer, he's a very worldly believer. And in this you know, book of Ecclesiastes is, is written to our 21st century world that's longing and lusting after the things of this life. What kind of possessions did Solomon have? Did this give him satisfaction? Why or why not? My guess is Solomon may have been the wealthiest person to ever walk on this planet planet. If you think of Bill Gates and you know, Warren Buffett, so the world today and all the wealth they have and others too. And you know, Solomon had even more wealth than them. But yet what he finds in the midst of having all this wealth is sadness and vanity and a chasing after the wind. It's not bringing him great satisfaction. He could have anything he wanted, worldly speaking but he's not finding true joy and peace and happiness with this. So the world cannot provide the answers. You know, so many people think in life, if I can only get more stuff, then I'll be happier. Take a look around. Look at all the celebrities in the last decade that, that have you know, lost their lives, that have you know, died of drug overdoses or suicides, even though they were completely wealthy, they had so much you know, stuff, worldly speaking, but yet they were empty on the inside. The world does not give you the answers. God gives us the answers through his word. How does Solomon view God in 314? I guess you can say in a nutshell what Solomon realized, there is a God and I'm not him. And God is God and God does eternal things. He does has a bigger picture than what he, Solomon, had. And Solomon had obviously a, a worldly picture of the kingdom he was trying to run. 
They realize that God is about eternal things and you can't change God. You can't add to what he's doing or take away from what he's doing. Um, so he respects God, honors God, realizes God's on a much higher plane than what he is, even though he's a very powerful man. What advice is given in 322? He's talking about to find pleasure and joy in the work that you do. And whatever that work might be, you know, to find joy and pleasure in, in, in what we do, you know, whether we're retired, if we're st stay at home, if we're, no matter you know, what the type of job we have, I pray we're doing things we enjoy doing, to, you know, to do things that where our, our skills and our talents can be used to their fullest. Read 4, 9 through 12. What can we learn from this, especially in regards to marriage? And so the whole section talks about two is better than one, and you get a better return with two. In fact, I was just heard today that, for example, you have you know one horse can pull a certain amount of weight, yet a second horse, you think, well, they should be able to pull double the weight. They can actually pull four times the weight. That when collaboration takes place, great things happen. What's interesting at the end of this section is a cord of three strands cannot easily be broken. It's going two, 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 then all of a sudden three. Where does the third one come from? And I truly believe that one is having God enter into the relationship, even in marriage, where two come together. Um, it's even better when God is in the picture, when there's three in that uh, marriage, and God is leading that marriage. The three is even better than two. Read 510. What example can we see this in our world today, how is it put into perspective in 515? You know, if you pursue after money, you will never find true satisfaction. In the end, you can't even take it with you. And you look at the world, and there's nothing wrong with, with having, you know, material blessings in life. But when they become your God, then your life is going to fall apart. You're worshiping things that are temporary. You never see a U-Haul at the cemetery. When we leave this world, we can't take our material things with us. And yet, this world is so short in comparison to the eternal picture that so many people are pursuing and pursuing and pursuing, and they're just not finding it. I remember one time there was a guy that he came off and said, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I'm starting this new business, and, and I tell you what, if, if I get successful, um, I'm gonna, I want to give 10% to the church, and, and I want to you know, support the church more. And, and so we prayed, but I was kind of questioning his motivation. And with time, what happened was his business took all his time. We hardly saw him in worship anymore. I'd see him, what's going on? I'm busy with my business. And eventually the business took up, took off. And, but yeah, I never saw, so to speak, the church never saw the 10% tithe he talked about. It's just the job consumed him. It took him away from church, away from, from God to a great extent. And, and then in the end, his business crashed and it, it failed. And Solomon would call that vanity. And, and in life, you know, we have to realize what really is most important. Is the things of this world or the things of God? Yes, we need to make a living, but not to be obsessed with that and, and lose perspective of what really matters. It's Jesus who says, what good is it if you gain the, the whole world but forfeit your very soul? And we see that same theme throughout a lot of Ecclesiastes. Pull out some phrases that strike you and write them down. And this is kind of more for you to decide. I, I pulled out one. I pulled from 7-1. It says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. And to me, it makes sense. You know, being born is great. Coming to this world and having life is a fantastic gift. But even a greater gift is someday that when I die, I'm going to be birthed into heaven. It's going to be into a better place. That really, I never am going to die. That when I leave this planet, it's going to be gain. It's going to be even better. That was one that jumped out at me. But again, like Proverbs, there's these sentences that have incredible meaning and purpose. And different ones are going to grab you in different ways. Read 7, 16 through 18. What important insights can we learn from this? Basically, he's saying don't be a person of extremes, of one extreme or another. Be a person of balance. Find balance in your life. And don't be obsessed and focus too much on any one particular thing. Just to try to be well-rounded in your life and to be a balanced person. And, and most of all, to have Jesus and have God in the center of your life. Read 7, 20 through 29. What is made clear with these verses? 
And it's, you know, again, it goes on for almost 10 verses there. But the point is that few people truly possess wisdom, according to Solomon. And very few, even few, are trying to seek wisdom. And again, there's godly wisdom and there's worldly wisdom. And godly wisdom is the best wisdom to pursue. And sometimes with, with Solomon, it seems like he's kind of vacillating back and forth between the two different types of, of wisdom. Um, but the bottom line is pursuing godly wisdom is a true blessing, and we should pursue it. And it's found in the Word and it's fulfilled in Jesus. That is where true wisdom is. Does Solomon have a very optimistic view of life? Why or why not? He really doesn't to a great extent. He's very negative in this particular book. Um, he sees the imperfections in mankind, the imperfections in himself. I mean, here's this guy who's got a thousand wives and concubine, but he's not finding true happiness and contentment in his worldly pursuits. And, uh, you know, his wisdom is helping him to see, and ne- unfortunately, the negativity of life, the problems of life. And, um, and he's you know, learning about God, too. We see he's got snippets of how God works here. But at the same time, we're just seeing more of a pessimistic view compared to Proverbs in particular. For much of Ecclesiastes, Solomon almost makes it sound like there is no afterlife. How, what is, however, what is brought to light in 12, 5 through 7? And in that section, very clearly he talks about eternal life, that when we die, the body returns to dust, but the soul or the spirit, it goes to God. And so he understands that You know, even the Old Testament is also very clear that there is an afterlife. There is a heaven, there's a hell, there's life here, and there's life eternal. And and Solomon brings out very clearly in this section. How does Solomon summarize his message in 12, 13, and 14? And how is this writing very different um, than Proverbs? And so two parts of the question. The first part is, he ends up by, you know, to fear and respect God, to keep his commandments, you know, to try to walk down the path of God's word is where you're going to find joy and contentment. And but what's interesting in this overall writing is that Ecclesiastes, we see Solomon coming in with a different type of attitude than we saw in Proverbs, that things don't always turn out the way we expect, and sometimes life can can send us some difficult curveballs, and sometimes things aren't fair, and and sometimes things don't turn out the way we expect. But still, in the end, God is in control, and the key is still to follow His word. And you know, unlike Proverbs, even for people that follow God's word and and are obedient to Him, sometimes they're still going to experience difficult things in life. There's no escaping the challenges of life, and so Ecclesiastes is is more, you know, I guess direct in portraying the challenges that life can bring. And we have one question here um, that deals with the next book, which is the Song of Songs. And you know, the Song of Songs, again, believed to be written by Solomon, is a book that is very different from all the other books of the Bible. It's very important you don't take it the wrong way. I think a lot of people try to put too much theological meaning into it. Some people try to say, well, it's an image of God in, in the Old Testament church or image of Jesus in his New Testament church. And we can't say that with certainty. It's, you know, it's a different type of literature and a literature that actually was in existence back then. You know, it's a, it talks a lot about love and, and passion and, and, you know, it's, it's really to be viewed more, you know, as a a book that shares it, it's okay to experience love. It's, it's, it's okay to have passion in the marriage situation, that excitement of the, you know, the husband and, and the wife, and hopefully something's not going to fade away over the years. And it's kind of a romantic literature found in the Old Testament. And archaeology has an earth more ancient literature similar to this. And the importance of that literature is not so often to be taken in, in deep symbolic code, but more just practical life that it's okay in this life to experience emotions and feelings and excitement and, and, and passion within marriage. Um, even sexuality is, is something that should be enjoyed in the context of a true marriage. It's kind of ironic that Solomon is the one that's believed to have written this because the guy has a thousand wives and concubine and, and he didn't do things the way that God would want for things to be done in that regard. So if it was him referring to himself, it's obviously in a relationship, maybe one of his first relationships where he's more 
all in. You know, I can't imagine what it was like for him to have a thousand wives and concubines. How do you meet the needs of all of them? You know, this never was God's plan, but still what God does want in marriage is for a man and a woman to come together and to enjoy feeling and emotion and passion and, and sexuality in the context which he intended for it to be and, and for love to be the enveloping characteristic of that relationship. And, and in a nutshell, that's what is believed to be the main focus of this particular and unique book in the Old Testament written by Solomon. With that, we're going to jump into... The New Testament, 2 Corinthians 9, we're going to finish that and begin the first part of Galatians. So we're going to start with question number one. What does chapter 9, verse 6 to 11 say about giving? Look carefully at the entire context. This is an amazing section about giving. And it begins by talking about that you know, what you receive in life so often ties into what you sow. And so when you sow, you receive back. It doesn't always mean a financial you know, gift coming back when we give to God, but there's blessings that come back that, that when we give in the name of Jesus Christ, we're giving to, to one who takes what we have from a worldly possession and, and can turn around and use it for eternal things. And so you know, what we reap is what we sow. And we're not meant to hold on tightly to the things of this world. Everything in this life comes from God and we are to hold on loosely and be willing to, to let things go and the more that we give away in life in general the more we see things come back the same is true with churches churches that turn inward begin to die churches that are generous and focusing outward are the ones that thrive it's different than the ways of the world but that's how God's economy works it's different than the world it's an upside down kingdom compared to the ways of this world and and then when we give we should find joy that God loves a joyful giver and it should be his grace that inspires us to give generously you know, in the Old Testament, they were forced to give, basically. They had to tithe. And here we see that in the New Testament, we give out of love and, and grace. And, and, you know, we should follow the Old Testament directives, but we should do it with joy. In fact, we can do even more than if God inspires us so to do it. What does Paul want to receive, or why does he want to receive a generous offering from the Corinthians? His desire is to support the church in Jerusalem. Now, everything started in Jerusalem. Remember, they fled. Most of Christians have fled Jerusalem because of persecution. And they fled for their lives. But some of the Christians stayed behind. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, was a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And, and they were probably worshiping underground, trying to hide from the Romans, hide from the Jewish people, or trying to persecute them. And they were struggling. And so Paul's trying to raise money for the mother church, the one that basically spawned and gave birth to all the other churches around the world at that time. What warning does Paul give in 11, 3, and 4? And it's really interesting, there's so much reference in the Bible about the mind. To not let Satan, the force of evil, lead us ast our minds astray. You know, and that regarding the, the gospel and the word of God, that we need to stay true to the word of God. We need to understand the word of God. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. It's the power against Satan. And we have to make sure that we don't let the force of evil in the world lead our minds astray. We need to think the right way. You get the mind in order and the rest follows. How does Paul defend his apostolic authority in chapter 11? Why does he do this? We see Paul talking a lot about all the things he's done. It almost sounds like he's I'm bragging. He's really not. He's just laying out to the Corinthians who have been questioning his authority, at times questioning his, his apostolic ability and authority. And, and he's basically standing up for himself and, and letting them know that, that you know, he's not a fraud. He's for real. That, and he's doing what he's doing for the glory of God. It's not for himself. And it, it's for the glory of God and for them. That his, he wants to benefit them. And so it's been a really strained relationship at times with these Corinthians who are very worldly. At, and he's given them some strong letters in the past to kind of set them straight. And he's just really wanting them to get on the right path. He, it's almost like a parent longing for a, a teenager who's, who's straying a bit to come back and to get back in the fold. Does 12.2, what does it mean that there is a third heaven? Or how is this section to be interpreted? 
So Paul's talking about a third heaven. He's seen visions of heaven. And some people take this the wrong way. The Mormon church has three levels of heaven. They sometimes say, well, here, right here, it talks about three heavens, but not in the context of the Mormon church interpretation. But for the Hebraic or the, even the Greek thought, there was you know, three levels of heaven. There's the atmosphere, then there's outer space, and then there's the heaven, heaven. So when Paul talks about the third heaven, he's talking about heaven, heaven, where God dwells. And so hopefully that makes sense. It's not three different heavens. There's one main heaven as we know it, but then there's the atmosphere, outer space, and there's the heaven, heaven. What is a thorn in the flesh? And what good came from the one that Paul had? You know, Paul had something he was struggling with. And what it is, we don't know. He just leaves it a mystery. Maybe that makes it even more fascinating. Mysteries are always something to kind of grab our attention. People try to say, well, maybe um, he had, you know, some type of a physical impairment or, or maybe he was struggling with blindness or um, had, you know, you know, some other disease or just, you know, it could be a number of different things. But we don't know. And the bottom line is, I believe every one of us has a thorn in the flesh, an area that we have a hard time controlling that is really pretty much out of our control. And what it does, it forces us to trust in God completely, to realize that through Jesus, that his grace is sufficient for us, and that these things we struggle with in life, they humble us. Whatever Paul's dealing with, it humbled him, and it made him even closer to God, and made the strength of God come through him even more powerfully. The key in life is to realize that we are weak, he is strong, the more that we humble ourselves into his mighty power, the more we see his hand and his power flowing through us and into the world. And so a thorn of flesh, we all have one. And I pray that what it does, it makes us humble and to realize that we're not in control of our own universe. Only God is control in control of the universe and to surrender our will and our lives to him completely and let his power be made sufficient through us by his grace. What concerns does Paul have in 12, 20, and 21? He's just really worried about how they're going to accept him. If they're not going to accept him or that he might be humbled by them, it's just been kind of a little bit of a strained relationship between Paul and, the, and the, this church in Corinth, and he's just really just you know, desiring to get close to them and, and for them to turn the right direction and not keep going in some of the wrong ways they were going. As Greek and you know, Gentile Christians, they were very worldly growing up. And, and so it's hard to change ways sometimes. It takes time. It takes work. It takes discipline. And he's trying to get them on the right path to, to not just know the Word of God, but to live it out in their lives and, and to leave that Epicurean way behind, which is to eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. How many times had Paul visited the Corinthians? This was going to be his third visit. So he'd visited two times prior, about ready to make his third visit. What test does Paul talk about in 13.5? And who and how do you know um, if you pass a test? And so that the test is basically whether or not Jesus is in us, okay? If he's in us, <laughs> We pass the test. That the most important thing in life is what's inside of us. Either Jesus is living in us or we've rejected him. And to pass the test is to believe in Jesus, that he lived and died, and that he rose for us. Question 10. What problem does Paul see in regards to the Galatians in 1, 6 through 9? And so we jump into the conclusion of, of um, 2 Corinthians, we are now jumping into Galatians. And what's happening here is, is Paul is concerned about these Galatian Christians, that they're being influenced by false teachings. They're being influenced by what's called the Judaizers, who are trying to get good works back into the picture, that it's not just saved by grace. No, it's, it's saved by grace plus. You have grace, but then you have to do certain things. There's, there's certain things you have to do to earn your salvation. And, and for those from the Jewish background, they're so used to lives that are focused on law-based things. You know, I do this, I do that. And whereas the Gentiles were coming from a completely different perspective. And so this letter is to set these Galatian um, Christians, you know, straight as far as what true theology is according to what God wants us to believe and what grace truly means, that we're saved by grace and not by works, but yet works is important, 
but not for our salvation. It's our response to our salvation. And finally, what does 1, 15 and 16 say about salvation? That even before we were born, we were set apart to receive this gift. That in the end, that God wants everybody to receive the gift of salvation, no matter who they are. And we've seen so many situations, especially in the Gospels, and you know, the, you know, the shepherd that has a hundred sheep and one gets lost, and he goes and pursues the one, and the person loses the coin, goes and tries to find that coin, and the prodigal son, that, that every person matters to God, and God wants every person to receive this gift of salvation. And that should be something we want for all people, no matter who they are. And so we're going to be digging deeper into Galatians um, next week. And hopefully you're getting a lot out of um, these letters from Paul and, and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomons, the Song of Songs is also called, um, two very um, interesting Old Testament books. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the blessings you pour into our life and help us to realize as we pull us all together that the world doesn't have the answers. The best thing for us to do in this life is to surrender ourselves to you and to try to follow your word, to try to find joy in the things we do for you, but to realize the key in life is to keep our focus completely and totally on you and to know this by grace that we are saved, but Lord, we desire to do the right things in life, to thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. So bless us as we continue to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.